Welcome, everyone. Um, we are now starting our webinar on e-scooters and how to regulate them in a manner that we can profit from their opportunities and also uh, address the challenges that they can bring. Um, we are happy to um, to have such great speakers uh, in this webinar. And thank you so much in the name of uh, the Wuppertal Institute and also uh, from the Urban Pathways Project perspective. Um, the idea is to have, we will have five different presentations. We will start with an overview of how the the e-scooters e uh, evolved over time in the past decade, given by Albin Mejia. Later, we will have the presentation from Stephen Perkins from the IPF Forum, uh, IPF um, Research Center, who will give an overview of the challenges of uh, micro mobility. Um, and later, we will have also the presentation from Diego Asunción from the municipality of Belo Horizonte, who will give also an overview of the challenges that the city of Belo Horizonte is currently facing with regards to um, the implementation of e-mobility or of e-scooters in the city. And that those questions, um, the idea is that are addressed by um, Emma Silver from BIRD and also from, from Matthias Van Pichnendale from, from the municipality of um, Brussels. Um, in order to give some inputs about from the operator's perspective and also from the um, local government perspective on what's the most effective way to regulate its scooters. So now I would introduce Alvin Mejia. He's a researcher and a research fellow in the Mobility and International Cooperation Research Unit at the Wuppertal Institute. He has been consultant for the UM for the Urban Electric Mobility Initiative for more than two years. And previously, he was the manager for low for the Low Emissions Urban Development Program at Clean Air Asia, and he conducts research on transportation and energy and trainings on clean fleet management and greenhouse gas accounting. Um, so please, Alvin, um, uh, now the floor is yours. I will um, make you a presenter now, and you're welcome okay. to start. Hi, everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening and good morning to, to you all. My name is Alvin Mejia, and I'm delighted to provide the first presentation today. Uh, it's basically a brief introduction about the emergent policy issues and interventions relating to electric kick scooters. I'll focus more on specific items uh, relating to the rationale for the emergence of e-scooters and discuss some of the issues and impacts, as well as share some observations regarding what has been ha happening in terms of the policy interventions relating to these devices. And uh, finally, provide some food for thought at the end to uh, provide some guidance for the next uh, for the discussion. So, um, why are we talking about e-scooters today? Uh, first, the e-scooter sharing systems have been uh, sweeping the globe since the introduction of the concept. Uh, at least the e-scooter uh, e sharing concept a couple of years back. In the US alone, e-scooter trips were estimated to be at 38 million trips in 2018. The map that you see here is not meant to be exhaustive, but it does provide an idea of the distribution of the e-scooter sharing systems globally. We've seen a lot of action in the US, in Europe, introductions in Latin America, Russia, and also in the Middle East. Secondly, they have been quite polarizing, either hated or loved. And thirdly, they're more, uh, really uh, disruptive, not in the negative sense of the word, but they're just really something new um, that needs proper integration and adjustments by the commuters, non-users, urban and transport authorities. So we now ask why e-scooters? Um, we've seen its emergence as a transportation mode by filling in specific niche in addressing urban transportation needs through the provision of unique combination of flexibility, comfort, range and speed, uh, which but can potentially insignificantly compete or complement other modes of transportation. In terms of the trip characteristics, as you may guess, uh, these e-scooters are primarily used for short trips, 
for example, in Austin, Texas, an average trip is about 1.1 kilometers with a speed of 9.2 kilometers per hour and uh, lasts about seven and a half minutes. <clears throat> These figures can vary depending on the area, but more or less you get the idea. In terms of the trip purpose, a survey done in the U.S., for example, um, tend to portray that these are being used directly for accessing workplaces or connecting to public transport, as well as uh, for recreational purposes. A recent uh, survey that was done in France uh, released last month uh, actually shows people ride these scooters, you know, to, to save time and also for, for fun. Uh, the survey also provides a glimpse towards the potential strain the, relating to the, the user's preference and the, the restrictions, uh, potential restrictions in terms of the usage of these uh, devices. Um, from a social perspective, uh, these devices may potentially attract more diverse groups of people, for example, women, as well as potentially provide more decent access option for lower income groups. Relatively cheap scooters can also be availed and owned by consumers uh, privately as seen on the top right chart. Uh, E-scooter services may potentially also tip scales towards higher public transportation patronage as they provide last mile solutions. Ultimately, they can contribute towards more equitable transport systems. But on the other hand, there are also a lot of concerns relating to safety, which I think Stephen will be discussing later on in detail, uh, particularly of pedestrians, vulnerable transport uh, users, um, concerns about equity, which relates to the choices of where the scooter sharing systems are to be placed and how they are priced, and in general, overall societal acceptance. Uh, some say e-scooters may alleviate congestion and its cost by shifting trips from low occupancy vehicles such as cars and again contribute towards helping public transport systems thrive. New forms of gig economies are popping up like the charging gig, which I think will also be discussed later from our colleagues uh, from, from BIRD. Um, on the other hand, due to competition, these e-scooters may potentially compete with public transport in itself and paratransit operators. Trips themselves may potentially cost more against other modes, specifically those of public transportation. In terms of the environment, if we assume that the uh, e-scooters take away substantial trips away from cars, maybe in terms of energy savings, CO2 savings, air pollution mitigation, we can get a substantial benefits. However, we must also take into account that e-scooters may potentially motorize walking and biking trips or shift trips away from public transport as seen on the, the right uh, based on the survey that was done in France. Um, so what ex one of the main questions is really what exactly is are, are e-scooters? Um, for me, I'm more comfortable describing them rather than actually defining them as uh, we have seen different definitions which are based on specific physical characteristics or based on operating conditions. They may be lumped with other similar devices or treated in existing policies separately, depending on the purpose. Um, another question to ask really is, is it a, considered a motor vehicle? As this is crucial is in terms of defining the rules for such vehicles. Um, in fact, in, in Singapore, they have now specifications for registration plates for e-scooters. In most states in uh, Australia, existing law state, they are not considered compliant to what constitutes a vehicle and thus they are illegal to be used on roads currently in most cases. Um, in other areas, they are not considered vehicles and are more akin to pedestrians and thus they can ride on the sidewalk. Who owns the scooters as uh, we, can, we will see later on additional options for cooperating with and uh, regulating e-scooter companies um, are also um, evolving. No? Um, so yeah, there, there has to be also consideration to other similar devices when developing e-scooter regulations and policies. Uh, perhaps very rigid definitions in the policies may, may, may backfire through loopholes that are created. Um, I'll now go through some of the policy examples, regulation examples relating to the scooters. Uh, first are those uh, relating to operations and equipment. In terms of regulating the users, there are existing regulations that focus on you know, uh, users themselves, age restriction, for example, or how the devices are used, mandatory or encouraged use of helmets, 
maintaining control of the vehicles, yielding to pedestrians, and sp speed limits. In terms of the scooters themselves, examples uh, focus on having visible identification, peripheral requirements such as the use of front rear lamps among uh, and, and, and other such devices. More importantly, compliance to standards and certification um, uh, based on international inter or national certification are particularly, uh, or those particularly relating to safety. In terms of where they can operate, as mentioned, there are uh, varying approaches to defining the operational zones for the e-scooters. Some cities would allow them to be used on the sidewalks, some on the bike lanes, some on the road, or a combination of these. As you can see on the right, for example, in uh, San Antonio, Texas, they have quite specific rules as to where you can operate them uh, based on the specific circumstances. Parking is also a significant issue, uh, but basically what we can observe in the existing policies is that the, these are common rules uh, that are based on preventing park scooters to be obstructions. Um, it becomes particularly difficult if there are no specific rules on designated parking areas or you know, if the scooters do not have the bike lock-like mechanisms as basically they can be vandalized or moved by anyone and can obstruct uh, uh, the walkways and other um, important entrances and exits. I'll now go through some examples of how cities are approaching regulations relating to scooter sharing companies. First, approval requirements would center on the provision of some or all of the um, elements as provided in the slide, maybe a part of a, as part of a business plan. The important thing to note here is that aside from the operational details, um, cities should also, consider, should also consider to include items such as uh, the ones at the bottom here, community outreach plans, equity plan, uh, to ensure that you know, the, the scooter sharing systems contribute to e equity improvements and maximize the cooperation in terms of data sharing. Cities are also integrating insurance requirements such as general liability insurance, automotive uh, liability, as well as worker compensation insurance from scooter sharing companies. What's also interesting now is that cities, or at least the ones in the US, are requiring indemnification agreements with the companies, basically stating that the local governments will not be held responsible for costs or damages arising from the direct or indirect use of these vehicles. Um, there are also various fee structures that are being imposed on these companies. The ones you see here are primarily examples, again, from the U.S. Uh, these fees relate to license applications, license renewal fees, fleet size-based fees, and fees covering for, you know, incidental expenses for the city governments, as well as penalties for non-compliance to certain stipulations um, within the agreements. Um, the advent of these uh, scooter sharing companies' uh, systems provide a unique opportunity for cities to know a little bit more about the movements as they are equipped with GPS devices. You can get a lot of data in terms of origin destination, uh, trip distances, uh, trip durations, and things like that, which might be useful for planning purposes in the future. Aside from these, um, data sharing agreements, standard reports are also being asked from these companies which basically contain operational indicators or service quality related indicators. In terms of uh, how the uh, the fleet sizes are determined or expanded in the future, um, these are some of the existing policies based these in terms of daily rider ridership or specific rules on monthly service uh, vehicle increments as well as fleet size caps or limits. Same goes with fleet reduction. Uh, but perhaps in the future, we can see more of service quality related evaluation that can play a role in this uh, in determining the fleet sizes as well. Uh, some cities, uh, for example, Louisville in Kentucky, are keeping in mind equity issues in determining priority distributions for the scooters. Ensuring access to the system is also important in this regard. And it might be important to look into options such as non-smartphone or non-credit card based access provisions. Discounts for disadvantaged communities may also be explored, uh, like what is being done in California where discounted membership plans are being offered to those who are part of existing financial assistance programs. <clears throat> Maintenance requirements, <clears throat> removal requirements, for example, of defective scooters, um, 
and other service quality related items are also part of existing initiatives Alvin? by local governments. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. You have three <clears throat> minutes. Yeah. Okay. I'm almost done. Um, to ensure uh, safe, equitable, and uh, efficient scooter sharing systems. So in summary, we have seen that uh, the current momentum of, of uh, that e-scooters and e-scooter sharing systems have as of the moment and the potential reasons as to why they have been emerging as a significant mode of transport um, in many major cities globally. Uh, while e-scooters can easily be conceptualized, they may uh, vary widely in terms of form and usage, and these are important considerations for policy development. They definitely can potentially fill in specific gaps in uh, on, or, uh, in urban transportation. Um, we have seen the potential impacts, both positive and negative ones, and look into various means and ways to maximize the benefits and alleviate the negative impacts, but these are all still evolving due to the infancy of the concept. Uh, these devices may provide a unique opportunity to know, to know more about our cities and for us to better integrate such new modes and to generate more insights as to how we may attain more sustainable urban transport systems. So basically this topic is not just about technology, but it's uh, intertwined with society and its views towards these devices and how they ought to be used and how governments respond and how holistic uh, views interplay with an appreciation of the local conditions, uh, which basically play a key role in determining the place of the e-scooter in our urban transport systems. So thank you very much for listening in the time, right? <laughs> thank you very much, yep. Alvin. Perfect timing. Yep. Um, thank you. Now I would like to uh, invite Steve, uh, Stephen Perkins. Stephen Perkins is the head of the Transport Research Center of the International Transport Forum at the OECD. The Transport Research Center undertakes economic research in support of transport policy development. The center's work covers all transport modes and most aspects of transport economics. Stephen's work at the forum has focused on issues of regulation, competition, investment, pricing and taxation, congestion, environmental protection and road safety. Please, Stephen. Thank you. Can you put my screen up? My, uh, yeah, your, uh, screen, your screen is there. It's already there. Oh, okay. It's just I mm -hmm. can't see it. So let me minimize this. I'll close it. Okay, good. So, well, first of all, thank you very much, Alvin. That was a com very comprehensive and complete presentation, really useful. And what I would like to do is talk a little bit about regulation of safety and regulation of space for shared micromobility uh, based on two events that we held over the last year. Uh, first of all, an a roundtable meeting, and you see the picture of the people at the roundtable, about 35 experts in uh, cycling safety. And some of the, well, a lot of their conclusions are very relevant to uh, e-scooters. And then also a roundtable meeting, a similar meeting on regulating app-based mobility services, the whole range of services from Uber to e-scooters. Um, so, well, and I should say uh, about these round table meetings, the people participating were a mix of people from regulatory agencies in local and national government, uh, academic experts, operators, uh, and urban planners. Uh, so a good mix of people. Um, and the reports, the conclusions published under our responsibility representing what we interpret to be the collective view of the people around the table. So not a fully official government position, but the view of the experts that we had uh, around the table. Um, so the safety issue is particularly important at the moment in government uh, safety agencies because of a trend of cycling deaths uh, being reduced more slowly than other modes and even compared to pedestrians and other vulnerable users. And in some cases where there's a lot of cycling, uh, there's been an increase over recent years in the number of uh, serious injuries and in some cases the number of deaths. Uh, the graph here illustrates recent data on serious injuries in the Netherlands. Um, but even the high rate cycling countries are not uh, all the same. 
In the Netherlands, they put down the reasons to being, uh, amongst other things, an aging population with uh, a lot more uh, older cyclists who are less physically fit, uh, able to avoid and and uh, and suffer injury without it being serious. Um, also, increased use of e-bikes, um, which again has brought a higher population of elderly cyclists into the market. Um, but if we look at some data that we've compiled from cities under our Safer City Streets initiative, in the middle, uh, under the bicycle icon, you can see the share of, uh, of um, fatal crashes in the city, in The Hague and in Copenhagen. And in The Hague, a very high number of uh, cyclists and in Copenhagen, a much smaller number of uh, share of cyclists. So that illustrates that there are big differences and we don't really fully understand what's driving those differences. So there's a lot of research needs to be done to understand really what the problem is and how to, uh, how to reduce um, injuries and deaths for cyclists and by extension for other uh, vulnerable users, particularly the new micromobility systems. And if we break down those numbers and do an important thing, which is look at the risk of fatality per unit distance traveled, we find that cycling actually performs pretty well compared to the other two vulnerable uh, user groups um, that we have good solid data for, for between pedestrians and uh, motorcycle. Um, bicycles perform or cyclists actually suffer uh, a much lower risk exposure. Uh, where e-mobility, uh, e-scooters fit in there, where we have a study, one study so far from BIRD, which cites the, the rate of uh, fatal crashes somewhere around the level of um, pedestrian fatalities uh, or, or cycling fatalities, a little bit better, in fact, than either of them so far on the limited data that's available. Um, and the other thing to take away, as you saw on the previous slide, was there's a big range of variation between different cities. So again, a lot to understand about what's driving the risk, but also a lot of potential for the poorer performing cities to achieve the levels of the best performing cities. Um, so conclusions from the round table on safety, um, the first thing uh, to conclude is that we need to set indicators and targets to drive pro progress. And um, the general road safety targets that have been set under the um, UN Sustainable Development Goals, for example, by the European Union of the 50% reduction in fatalities across the board seem a suitable level of ambition uh, in the cycling area as well and benchmarking comparing performance between cities and between countries is particularly useful in starting to try and understand uh, what more can be achieved. Um, but safety is not everything and any policies towards cycling, e-bikes, micromobility needs to be set in a broader context of what we're trying to achieve uh, in terms of mobility, particularly in our cities when it comes to uh, e-scooters. Um, so the safety policies that we adopt need to contribute to the overall sustainable development goals and need to be positive in terms of getting more people into active mobility for their health and assisting in reducing congestion levels from motorized traffic um, to reduce the local pollutant emissions and CO2 emissions and congestion itself. So in that perspective, our uh, Roundtable concluded that we would not be making a recommendation on mandatory helmet legislation, particularly on the shared versions of cycling and e-scooters. Um, it is likely to be a strong deterrent if there's helmet legislation that is um, well enforced. Um, what we've learned from the bike share systems, if there have been, even if it's difficult to put uh, to put them through a cost benefit uh, assessment of exactly what they're delivering uh, on the sustainability agenda. What we've seen is that they've tended to drive higher usage, not just of the shared systems themselves, but also of uh, conventional cycling. 
um, there's an effect of the mass of the number of people on the road and possibly also the bringing people that are not regular cyclists onto the road on bicycles. Drivers very rapidly respond to giving them more space, treating them with caution, which creates a calmed environment. And the more cyclists there are, the safer it is for the cyclists and the perception of safety improves. So there seems to be synergies between the shared systems and private ownership, the traditional ownership of bicycles. And the same probably goes for e-scooters. Um, the regulatory conclusions that we came to was simply set technical standards for the critical safety uh, equipment, um, particularly brakes, lights, but also the physical uh, robustness of the bicycles and the uh, e-scooters so that they don't suffer mechanical faults. Um, and requests that uh, uh, in agreement with Alvin's presentation, it's very useful to get data from the GPS systems uh, on e-scooters and e-bikes and shared biking systems for public authorities to understand the patterns of use to which they've put to start to get an idea of what benefits they're bringing and where yeah, issues may uh, lie or be concentrated. Now, this is not a, a, uh, a call for regulating that all data must be dumped and downloaded for governments to use. It's more a case of trying to get an agreement, cooperative agreement between the local authorities and the operators on what actually would be useful for the for the public authorities to know, and then working out what subset of data is actually useful to report. And operators like Bird or Grow are actually pretty keen to get involved in doing that. Um, I think Alvin's uh, outline of the kind of data fields that would be used so is a very good starting point, but I'm not sure. Well, at least there's work to be done still on then cataloging what is being done, developing what Alvin presented to be able to come up with a recommended template of what uh, a new uh, new entrant should be asked to provide to, to a city that's just beginning to authorize use of e-scooters. Then turning to the other roundtable, um, which looked at the economic regulation of app-based mobility services, the it's really about competition issues. Alvin mentioned the potential competition with incumbent operators such as taxis, uh, where there can be strong resistance to the entry of services. We saw that with uh, Mobike in China when they first entered. All the uh, apocryphal pictures that we saw of heaps of bicycles uh, being abandoned in front of supermarkets, for example, was actually action by taxi drivers to uh, try and create political uh, pressure to um, unlicense um, the operators. Uh, so we happen to be a little bit cautious with a picture of uh, all the birds that were dumped into a waste bin in uh, one of Alvin's slides too. Um, so there's competition also with incumbent dog bike share systems, which local governments have invested significant amounts of money into. And um, when most of them went through a process of considering, well, should they, should they have more than one dog bike operator or should they make the local monopoly run by the government so that you could get an economy of scale, sufficient users to uh, reduce the subsidy that was required to run the system or even make it profitable. So those, First movers are there and often owned or at least uh, in, uh, closely regulated by the um, local authority with a concession to give the right to operate them. And some local authorities uh, feel that that will take business away from their uh, docked bike share systems and then make the funding of those systems more fragile. So there was resistance from some uh, local governments to the entrance of uh, shared bikes, dockless shared bikes, and uh, e-scooters on that basis. Public transport operators um, also view the, these systems um, sometimes as competition that will take away ridership, particularly on thinly served lines, and then make those services no longer viable. Uh, and um, on the other hand, as Alvin uh, discussed, they provide very useful last mile services and the complementarity of uh, e-scooters and shared bikes more generally uh, is perhaps more is perhaps a dominant factor if the way that the public transport operator and the local government that concessions those services 
um, looks at the big picture rather than just at the financial sustainability of the services that it's already put in place. Um, and then the other area of competition is, of course, for road space, uh, pavement space, and also bike lane space. And uh, as sea scooters enter uh, the market, they're obviously often most unpopular with bike users who don't like to be overtaken by these new uh, users often uh, behaving strangely because the first time they use the scooter, they're using it for fun rather than for uh, a commute and uh, very unpredictable uh, driving uh, patterns. Stephen, sorry yes. to interrupt you. You have three minutes. Okay. Um, so the environmental benefits or m sustainable mobility of benefits of uh, e-scooters are a little different than uh, conventional cycling. One, they're used by more diverse groups. Um, they're, they're suitable for hotter climates, for um, occasional trips uh, without ownership. Um, they don't require the physical effort. So they're providing a lot of additional trips which do have a consumer value. And so these services are not going to go away. People actually value what they're using them for but they have lower health benefits than active transport, actually cycling. Um, they have similar local air pollution and car congestion relief uh, potential benefits, but they have some additional environmental and resource impacts uh, with the disposal of batteries and the vehicles themselves, which may turn out to be quite short-lived. Um, so the position that we take overall is a very liberal one that um, they, all these e-mobility systems need to be promoted and then regulated. Promoted first or allowed first to enter the market and regulated progressively afterwards. We um, are concerned that the incumbent operators uh, tend to try and prevent entry of operators uh, like the new e-scooter systems, uh, denying consumers um, the value of the services that they offer and the potential sustainability benefits that they might be able to contribute to. So we see it as better to allow them in, uh, maybe make a bit of a mess at the beginning, but there should be quite a bit of tolerance that the systems will settle down, people will get used to using them, used to seeing them on the road and start sharing the space better. So the recommendation would be to authorize and then bring in regulation progressively um, in the way that Paris is doing at the moment. They started off with a bit of chaos, but now they're bringing in fines for using them in inappropriate places, as in on pavements, um, or f for use you get a fairly, for use on pavements you get a fairly high fine, about 350 euros, for parking inappropriately, about 30 euros. But in uh, countering that, the mayor will gradually make designated spaces available on the pavements for parking bicycles, and it has an ongoing investment program in segregated bicycle lanes. And, uh, so the two go hand in hand rather than uh, trying to prevent entry before uh, you have all the systems in place. Um, there has to be a bit of give and take. Um, in terms of the safety recommendations, um, you know, light segregation, what these calls armadillos in your part of the word, Maria Rosa, um, a small physical barrier to separate the traffic seems to be a pretty useful compromise, contested by some road safety experts as not the full deal, but much cheaper and quicker to put in and, and can be moved to, from one place to another um, to provide a rapid expansion of the reserve space for these new mobility modes. Um, Junctions are the particularly sensitive area where more expensive and careful treatment is required. Uh, a lot of the crashes happen at junctions, especially where the lane arrives without a clear route for where cyclists or e-scooter users are supposed to go and keeping them separate from the traffic. On the vehicle side, uh, making them more uh, apt to stick to speed limits and um, avoid uh, fatal pedestrian and vulnerable user impacts is important. There's some technology available there. Um, but as I said earlier, uh, a lot more research is required to differentiate between conventional bikes, e-bikes, um, and the uh, e-scooters. We will be starting an initiative beginning of next year to try and uh, help our uh, national road safety data agencies 
uh, do that and achieve some confidence that the different kinds of micromobility are being reported separately rather than being lumped into uh, bicycles or lumped into some other mode. Um, that was the detail of the bird report. Um, and the good practice is to share the space, provide adequate space for these new modes, um, but to regulate them uh, as we develop. So um, I can, uh, yes, I said all those points earlier. And I think in the end, the main political question is how we share the space. Um, and how quickly we can reallocate space from particularly from cars, which is easy to say, politically often difficult to implement. So that's it. Thank you very much and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Stephen. It was a very useful input. Thank you very, very much, you both, Alvin and Stephen. And um, now I would like to um to start with some polls and i will also would like to um remember uh, remind you to the audience that you can send your questions permanently we will collect them all and at the end we will uh, sort them out and ask them to the specific speaker so please make sure that when um you pose a question you write the name of the speaker you want to address it to, or if it's to all, or the, the names of the speakers you want to address them to. And right now we would like to, before we pass to the, um, um, to the part of the local government and how to regulate from a more uh, practical perspective, we would like you to answer these quick polls, these quick questions. Um, because it will be very interesting. We know there are a lot of people from municipalities participating, so it will be very interesting for us and I guess for the development of the webinar to know um, if there are already e-scooters providers operating in your city. Um, we will, we have now 72% of the audience voted. And we are still waiting for the other 26% now. Can you tell us how to vote, Rosa? Yeah, I will, I will show the results in a minute. No, can um, you tell us how to do it? Ah, no, I guess you cannot, oh, as a panelist, I think you cannot vote. Apparently oh. only attendees can <laughs> Second vote. <class>. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, like, but in, a couple of seconds, I will share the results. 83% of the audience, 85% of the audience voted so far. And these are the results. So 58% of the audience um, said that there are already e-scooters operators in their cities. And the second question will be, um, if there are already regulations for e-scooters operators in your city? That's the second question. And people is voting very quickly. We already reached 81% and 85. And so the results of that one are that 45% um, already have regulations in place for e-scooters. So I think this could be also an input for the presenters. Um, and now I would like to give the floor to Diego Asunção. He is project management analyst at the Belo Horizonte Transport and Traffic Company, Beja Trans. And um, he works in planning, controlling, and monitoring activities of transport and traffic project of the city of Belo Horizonte in Brazil. So please um, let me um, give you the floor. Give me one sec. Um, 
here you are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you can share your your screen with us, and I would also like you to share. Okay. Hi, Diego. Hi. How are you? Um, There's a little background noise, but I think that when I'm when I mute my microphone, it will be gone. I hope. If not, I will let you know. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So you can. Okay. Uh, so uh, first of all, good evening and good morning for everyone, and. My name is Diego. I work at the Transport and Transit Authority in Belo Horizonte, Brazil. Uh, Belo Horizonte, for those who don't know, is a city in the southeast of Brazil. Um, it's quite near of uh, Sao Paulo in, in Rio. And now we are facing some challenges regarding the regulation of e scooters in the city. So. Uh, we'd like to to share with you the questions we're having and how we are facing and tackling this this demand. So, just a second. Okay. So first of all, um, now in Brazil we have 13 cities with that already uh, are operating with e-scooters. So we have São Paulo, Rio, Goiânia, Florianópolis, Curitiba, Recife, Porto Alegre, eh, Brasília, Belo Horizonte, uh, Vitória, and other three uh, municipalities in São Paulo. We already have in Brazil uh, a resolution number 415 of the Brazilian National Transit Council and it's a resolution from the year of 2013 and it's not uh, about e-scooters but uh, electric bikes so we are using this resolution to start implementing a new regulation for uh, e-scooters so the resolution number 415 it says that the circulation uh, of the the electric vehicles must be only on on sidewalks with a maximum of speed of six kilometers per hour and in cycle paths with a, mass, a maximum speed of uh, 20 kilometers per hour and we there is a, a mandatory use of ex uh, some accessories uh, like speed indicators bike bells and night signaling uh, the lights in the front uh, and side of the vehicle. Um, so, as I said, uh, we have uh, a resolution from 2013, but we don't have a resolution or some de or any decree or document talking about the e-scooters. So the other rules uh, are, are being defined by the municipality right now. So the municipality, uh, while the, the, the Brazil Feder Federation uh, didn't implement any, implement any uh, kind of resolution, the municipalities are going to define their own rules. So some Brazilian cities, they already have uh, regulated electric scooters. Uh, according to this 415 resolution from the National Transit Council, or by creating their own rules, such as permission to drive on roads with maximum speed of 40 uh, kilometers per, per hour. Uh, it's important to say that there are some actions in court questioning some of these regulations, whether by uh, operators, individuals, or associations. So we have, we uh, are having a lot of discussions about this this issue. So we are having legal uh, questions about the use of e-scooters uh, by a lot of parts of the society. So uh, 
so we as we don't have uh, a, a resolution uh, defined so the the, the tra national transit council it gave us some recommendations about the use of e-scooters so there are so I listed some of these recommendations. So to descend from the equipment, to make a safe crossing, to avoid, to avoid places with a lot of people and bicycles, to use personal protective equipment such as helmets, gloves, knee pads, elbow pads, even when not required, uh, not to park these e-scooters so as they can turn into obstacles for free, to free movement. And an adult must supervise the use of an electric scooter by a minor. Um, so now uh, I'm going to show you uh, the overview of the city of Belo Horizonte. So what we, what's the scenario right now in, in the city I live in? So in Belo Horizonte, we have 83 kilometers of cycle routes, and most of which are outside of the areas of great demand. So these cycle routes are quite disconnected from each other. So we don't have uh, a, a really good integration in these cycle routes. So this integration would allow the use of e-scooters, but now we don't have it. So we can assume that the cycle network is insufficient to meet demand, and we have to admit, uh, admit the circulation of these scooters on sidewalks, which is not safe for pedestrians. So what I, I, I want to, to say is uh, most of the people right now in Belo Horizonte are using uh, e-scooters downtown, so, and we don't have a lot of bicycle routes uh, on this area. And uh, another important point is that between January and May of this year, we had uh, 70 accidents involving e-scooters, which is uh, uh, a high number. Uh, we already did some uh, definitions. So what we uh, already decided is that we posed a prohibition to ride on sidewalks with high pedestrian volume and a permission to ride on pedestrian areas in 30 kilometers per hour zones. And the company operators, they need to contract the civil liability insurance. Other definitions we already made, uh, the user has to reposition the equipment parked uh, according to the rules of, of the park in the city, so they don't uh, they can't disagree the, the 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 parking rules defined by the city, and we need we define that we we will create a permanent a permanent customer service center for these e scooters and users, and the company operator needs to share with the municipality with the we do the transit and, and transport authority, all the real time open data of the scooters. Um, um, this data needs to be confidential about users' personal information, and the use of scooters needs to be individual. We are seeing a lot of uh, parents with their child, with their children. In, in in Brazil, using the e-scooters like riding together, so it's very dangerous. And this is one of the definition we would like to make. The use of scooters needs to be individual. Um, we want that, we want to make information about the rules of use of the scooters available to all users. So once we have an app, uh, regarding the use of e-scooters, uh, we would like to show a manual of all the rules and and how to use the, the equipment. Um, another definition is to provide reliable, safe, and quality equipment to all the users respecting Brazilian standards, and to make available a manual of safe driving to the user to the vehicles to the users about the vehicles and the application offered. So uh, 
I already talked about the, the definitions we already have, but now there are uh, a few questions we still don't know how to face it, and we'd like to share with you. Um, first of all, we would like to know how to, how, if, how should we regulate the e-scooters parking in the sidewalk furniture area or previously uh, in some defini defined locations or next to bicycle racks? We are not sure about it. Um, another question we have is, should parking in the sidewalk furniture area based uh, be limited to to five equipment, so uh, we can uh, restrict the number of equipment in the area. This is, it is a question we, we have. Can people older than 16 and younger than 18 obviously uh, ride the e-scooters? So uh, this age restriction is not very clear for us. Uh, is it mandatory or recommended to use individual pro uh, protective access accessories? We uh, are, are facing some resistance of the companies of uh, implementing or giving these um, uh, protective accessories. So we would like to discuss if this should be mandatory or just recommended. And uh, should accessories be supplied by the operator? So it's the question I, I, I told before. Um, the the use of helmet, the helmets need to be uh, bought by the user, or or just the operator operator needs to supply. Um, and finally, uh, should the operators be charged for the provision of these e-scooters in the municipality? So the, opera the operators need to pay any tax to, to provide this service. Should the user be charged for the use of the route, like uh, 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 another tax? Should penalties be imposed on the operator for improper use of the scooter by the user? So who is supposed to pay for any penalties? Uh, it, it's the user or just the or, or the operator. So it's a discussion we we need to to do also. Should the operator be required to cope damage to public equipment? So if there is an accident and there is a damage to any public equipment, so uh, who's supposed to to cover this damage? Uh, the operator or the user. So uh, yeah, so I'd like to thank you uh, for the time and and to listen to all the questions we are having right now. So I uh, would appreciate to to listen to you about the, the, the what do you think about the challenges we are facing right now. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you very much, Diego. Uh, it was really great to, to have your input, and I am pretty sure that the questions that you just posed will definitely um, help the the speakers, the, t the next two speakers, um, reply to some of them. And um, but before, I would also like to add another poll, um, um, which I think will summarize also some points and um, so based on your experience what could be are the biggest challenges of e-scooters in your city so these are the results so we have that um, most people in, was inclined to think that public space uh, would be one of the biggest challenges, but also closely to road safety. So now I would like to introduce you to Emma Silver. Emma Silver works on government partner partnerships and public policy across Europe, the Middle East and Africa, as well as Asia Pacific for birth. She is a former special advisor to the UK government working in both the transport and environment briefs during her time in government. So, Emma. Um... Okay. 
thanks so much to everyone uh, who's dialed in and is joining uh, to listen to this webinar. There's lots to pick up on there. Um, I now feel like I should have a lot more in my presentation about safety because that's one of the big concerns coming out from, um, from all you guys. Uh, so let's start at the beginning of the presentation, not the end. <laughs> This is me. Uh, so in the bottom right hand corner, that's my email, that's my Twitter handle, uh, which is my maiden name. If anyone wants to get in touch, please feel free to, to get in touch with me through those um, those, the, those mediums afterwards. For those of you that don't know, Bird is a last mile electric vehicle sharing company and we're dedicated to bringing affordable and environmentally friendly transport solutions to cities across the world. Since first offering our scooters to cities in 2017, we've proudly worked towards our mission of making cities more livable by reducing car usage, traffic and emissions. We are now in 120 cities globally and almost everywhere um, that, we are, that we are currently operating, the governments actually allow us uh, mostly on the roads and in the cycle paths. I know there was a bit of conversation just now and Diego raised the issue about whether or not scooters should be allowed to mix with pedestrians. And I think that with a view to the safety issue that a lot of you are interested in talking about today and hearing more about, um, it's absolutely paramount that speeds are, are throttled down and capped to a much, much lower speed if you are going to mix pedestrians um, and e-scooters. I know that New Zealand is, is doing this at the moment and it has created a lot of problems. Um, broadly speaking, if you look at cities across the world, you get a few places where bikes and pedestrians mix, but they don't tend to make a very good mix. So I think that that's really a, a city planning issue that people need to think about quite carefully. Um, let's move on. I want to send you, show you this next slide really quickly. I won't spend very long on it. That is what our user interface looks like for our dockless rideshare solution. Bird also rents scooters for longer periods and we're experimenting with delivering them uh, and in some markets we actually sell our scooters as well but this is what you see if you rent a scooter um, on your smartphone. Um, ride share is always really going to be core to our business. Um, I know that there were some questions, I think it was Stephen who raised them about the robust nature of a vehicle. Now the vehicles that we use for our ride share are not the same as the vehicles that we sell. Um, and the reason for that is that a rideshare vehicle needs to be a lot more robust. So it needs to have um, a much longer lifetime in the field because it's going to get several rides a day, whereas a scooter that's privately owned isn't. So I think that in terms of what cities should be looking for in good partners, rideshare partners, is absolutely a very, very high specification of vehicle and not a vehicle that can just be bought um, on the open market and customised. Certainly that is where Bird was, I'll be frank, when we started, um, but that's not what we use now. We now have a customised vehicle and I think that's absolutely the right direction of travel and what cities should be looking for. Um, I don't really want to start drilling down city by city into sort of local issues and, and case studies too much. Do feel free to ask questions, um, but let's just cover some broad themes. Um, I think you probably all know that we have a climate crisis on our hands and that's really where the electric scooter rideshare model came from. Transport is a huge component of the um, environmental crisis that we're facing. We've got um, a problem with what to do with all the cars. We've got parked cars lining our streets. You build new roads and those fill up with traffic just as quickly as you can build them. And cities are slowing down as they grow. The average traffic speeds in central London, according to TfL, fell from about 9.2 miles an hour at the start of 2010 down to about 7.4 miles an hour by the start of 2017. That's quite a dramatic drop when you think about people traveling from West London to East London, as I did this morning, um, are traveling a distance of about eight miles. So they really, it really is slowing down those journeys. And while governments are encouraging people to buy electric cars, I worry that they're trying to fix the wrong problem by doing that. We aren't going to solve the, the transport problem that we have at the moment with the same thinking that got us into that problem. And that is why city planners need to start thinking about, you know, stop being so car centric, basically. For the most part, cars aren't an efficient use of space in our cities anymore. Um, we know that building new transport infrastructure, whether it's a road, whether it's railway, whether it's a tube, is hugely expensive. Um, add on top of that the, the issue of air quality and the general livability, as we call it, of a city. Um, and as far as I can see, it turns out that even if it's electric, it's still not efficient if it's a car 
because we've got this issue of space. Um, we touched on parking a little bit um, briefly. It comes up quite a lot in the markets where we've been operating for longer and where we have lots of competitors. And the reason for that is more scooters in the city means they become more noticeable to residents, to officials. People start to ask, where are all these scooters going to go? And then people start to say, we don't think we want all of these scooters here and we need some rules for these scooters. Um, this is one of the solutions that, that we present. Um, you know, there are lots of other ways that you can tackle and manage this problem as an operator. But look, this only works in partnership with cities. This only works if cities dedicate space to micro mobility parking. Um, far too often operators and riders are, are told, please don't park here, but they're not told where they can park. So we need to stop, as I said before, thinking about things in such a car centric way. I'm not anti car and there's certainly always going to be a place for people to have cars and some people will always need cars. But if you look around at most major European cities and, and certainly in the US, this is true as well. You don't need to walk more than a block to find somewhere to park your car. It might cost you a lot, but you can do it. Um, and, you know, I think until we have that same saturation level in major cities of micro mobility and dockless parking, then we are going to have this problem, no matter what the operators do in terms of um, a solutions like this one that uh, that is shown on this slide here. So the, the bike lobby has campaigned globally for more park, parking for push bikes and electric bikes. And we're only really starting to see them get it now in cities in large quantities. I'm very lucky that I live in Amsterdam now where there's lots. Um, I really hope we don't have to wait that long to get that level of parking for micro mobility. Um, back to the point about space though, this is why space is important. And this is why we have to stop prioritizing cars. At the top, you can see there the number of uh, vehicles per hour. You can see from this whole slide how space is used in urban transport when cars aren't parked or stationary or when bikes aren't parked or stationary. The different modes have vastly different um, capacities. This illustration is showing you the hourly capacity on a three meter wide uh, lane by different modes. And this is assuming peak conditions and normal operations. Along with the health benefits, you do need a big push for, for walking and cycling because it frees up that space. It's a more efficient use of the limited space that we have in our cities. We know the uptake of walking and cycling is slowing in many instances, and we need to start thinking about how to capture those final few groups of people. Um, and one of the other panelists mentioned this earlier, who just aren't adopting walking and cycling. And for cycling particularly, it is um, certain ethnic minority groups and it is women and sometimes it is the elderly. So what's the solution? Um, aside from e-bikes, e-scooters. Um, these are the vehicles that we sell at the moment and this is a similar similar to what our newest model of rideshare vehicle will look like as well. They're much lighter, they take up less space, it's a human-sized lightweight mobility solution. Um, a lot of people ask if people are going to start riding electric scooters, are they going to stop walking? And mode shift is an issue. Um, undoubtedly, there will be some trips that would have been walking trips that will be electric scooter trips. Um, but overwhelmingly, um, nothing has ever got Americans, certainly, out of their cars like electric scooters have. Um, these are really replacing car trips, as you can see from this bar chart here. These American cities, um, you know, people self-declared how they would have uh, traveled otherwise. Um, and in many instances, that was by car. This uh, Naxo report, I think, was also mentioned by one of the other panelists, but it shows you on the far right hand bar here, dockless electric scooter share was nowhere in 2016, 2017, and it went straight from nowhere to basically close to 40 million rides in one year. And that didn't actually cannibalize the share of station based docked bike share. And it didn't seem to cannibalize the dockless bike share either. All it did was added new journeys. So when we talk about mode shift, we do need to think about a broader question here, not just are we changing one trip for another. Sometimes we're creating trips here as well. And that's particularly important for reasons that I'll come on to around, um, around equity, as we call it. Um, this is a map of New York City. 
Um, and it's really helpful to look at this and to think about the economic impact that transport can have. So the black lines are the public transit and we mapped uh, on this map how many people in New York City housing authority accommodation could be better connected if electric scooters could actually operate in the city. They're not currently allowed, as you might know. Um, so you might know about transport deserts. Those are the places in cities that are more than 15 minutes by walk or by cycle from the nearest public transport stop. By offering transport alternatives to connect people in these places, we can improve people's lives. We can make it easier for them to get to home, to work. They'll maybe use a black cab in London. Maybe they'll use an Uber. Um, but you know, if you're living in a poorer part of the city, uh, if you don't have the money to spend on taxis, then you do need a, a reliable and affordable alternative. And electric scooters perform that. So you, you can't get very far if you walk. You can in 15 minutes, maybe a mile, depending on how quickly you're walking. But you can get about three times that distance on an electric scooter. So there is a real benefit to micromobility, um, to society from micromobility. And just remember, the affordability point is really key for those people from, from low income households. Um, I want to talk quickly about um, something that we offer cities in terms of data and the importance of data sharing. And I think a lot of cities are starting to build this into what they ask um, and, uh, from operators if they want to come and operate in the city. Um, this is a, a, a sort of picture screenshot of uh, what the dashboard um, that we share with our cities. Traditionally, transport planners got very limited information about how people and, and visitors to their city move around. Bird can really change that and revolutionize that by offering data to cities. Typically, this is data such as trip distance, um, trip time, heat maps showing where journeys commonly start and finish. Um, it can help transport planners to notice new trends that happen over time, whether that's weeks or months, as well as seeing real time maps and understanding estimated environmental impacts, all kinds of things that can be drawn from that data. For us, partnering and collaborating with cities is really important when it comes to data. Um, before launching in a city, we want to understand what the local needs are. We then want to come back to the city and say, here's how we can think we can improve things. Um, and it also helps us to understand when we need more scooters or when maybe when we need fewer scooters in a city. So one of the things that comes up a lot is, is the issue of clutter and whether or not there are too many scooters in the city. The data can actually show you, is it that there are too many or is it that they're in the wrong place? I am not sure how I'm doing for time, but um, I will come to some, some sort of closing remarks now. We talked a little bit about the space in cities, um, emissions, parking, modal shifts, economic impacts data. Um, and I suppose I should have covered safety a bit more in hindsight, but we do have the, um, the bird safety report that Stephen mentioned that I'm very happy to send any of you if you'd like to read it. To answer some of the questions that, that Diego asked in his, um, in his presentation and to sort of draw this to a close, I suppose if dockless e-scooters are going to work, and I hope they will, then cities and governments do need to think through a few key important issues. So number one, the rules of the road and how um, riders will share the streets with other vehicles. Um, e-scooter riders are vulnerable road users, as we call them in the UK, much like pedestrians and cyclists are. So we need to think carefully about where we put them and the rules that we tell them that they should abide by, whether that's speed or, um, or, or anything else. Any delay in kind of establishing those those safety rules um, and public guidelines is just going to risk um, increasing the public opposition that we're starting to see in some places and meaning that in certain places you'll get rules that are more restrictive than are necessary. And I think that'll be a bad thing because it will um, decrease the utilization of electric scooters. Parking uh, needs to be properly planned, as I mentioned, to prevent all the scooters ending up in the wrong place. And regulators need to allocate that dedicated parking. parking. So it does need to be a joint effort with cities and the uh, operators working together. We need to plan for micromobility car parking in the same way that we plan for car parking. Um, and finally, permits and data requirements. So data sharing could be a condition of the permitting process. Um, cities might like to, to, to start writing that into permits. Um, and I think that can only be a good thing to share more data and build more intelligence together about how to improve access and transport for citizens. Thanks for listening today. And I'm really keen to hear what everyone's questions are. Thank you very much, Emma. That was a great presentation. It is great to have also the operator's view about how e-scooters can contribute to sustainable mobility. I'm pretty sure our um, audience has a lot of questions for you as well. And please 
feel free to send us your questions. We are, uh, we just have one more presentation, so it will be great if you can send you your questions right now so that we can sort them out and ask the questions at the end uh, after the presentation of Matthias. So now I would like to introduce um, Matthias von Van Vignedaele is a cycling policy expert. He is responsible for the bike infrastructure and cycling services at the office of Brussels Mobility Minister Pascal Smith. He finds inspiration for good public space design as a father of two kids. He is an improv player. So um, you can now start. I can still not hear you. Mm, ah, I muted you. Now you can speak. Yeah. Mm, I can still not hear you. I think you have to unmute your microphone now. Now you can hear me. Yes, now I can hear you. Okay. Uh, welcome uh, to this session. Uh, effectively, I want to discuss with you one question. Uh, are scooters a problem or are they the solution for uh, your city? Uh, my name is uh, Matthias van Wendale, as uh, Maria said. Uh, I'm advising uh, cities on cycling services uh, and sometimes also about uh, micromobility technologies. Uh, but since I'm the cycling policy advisor of the Brussels Mobility Minister Pascal Smet, um, uh, I will discuss this from the point of view of the Brussels region. Uh, and as Maria said, I have two children growing up in Brussels. They are my inspiration for human scale cities and bike friendly design. Um, I will, so I will uh, explain you a little bit more about Brussels uh, very quickly. Uh, in 58, we started uh, reconstructing Brussels as a city for cars uh, because uh, th this was the era of modernism and progress and the individual car was uh, the symbol, of course, of that. Uh, and so we built uh, new districts outside the city and uh, the old inner city wasn't interesting anymore. Uh, uh, car, car parking places were uh, constructed in uh, the city um, uh, with the means to go to the outskirts of the city and to go visit the World Expo um, uh, fair that was organized in 1958. We didn't stop doing this. Uh, we, we, we constructed um, uh, big infrastructures for cars uh, until the late 80s, and this is also a picture you can see uh, of the car parking, but also today, still today, we have 350,000 commuters coming to uh, from the suburbs, from the outskirts of, the, of Brussels, towards the city for working. Uh, this is because we organized this urban exodus and, uh, and uh, since we invested so much in car infrastructure, the livability of Brussels wasn't uh, any more uh, what we uh, need. Uh, and so the half of the people, of the commuters are coming by car. And uh, this is a big problem uh, for our public space, but also for uh, livability of uh, our city. Uh, we have only 7% uh, bike share at this moment. This is too low. We want to go to 20%. And we want to, to look at the Netherlands and uh, um, uh, Denmark, for example, uh, on how to push um, more people and human scale uh, public space and cities uh, in Brussels. This is a little bit our vision, how, do, how we see it, eh? how um, Brussels should be. It's the same street, but on a car-free Sunday. Uh, and what you see is everything. Eh? You see clean air, you see uh, uh, green parks, you see uh, buses and uh, tram rails. And uh, in front of the picture, you see children not wearing helmets. Uh, they are not scared of cycling in the city, but they, they uh, are enjoying the city. Eh? Uh, it's what Emma said also, uh, make, uh, make it fun also. Uh, and this is what our vision is, to make uh, cycling more fun in, uh, in the city. Uh, and so um, it's not easy, eh? the change. Um, every, it's a continuous struggle for taking space from cars and giving it back to the people, whether it's uh, an urban square uh, or whether it's a, a cycle path. Uh, and that is because we need to fight uh, every project uh, apart uh, again and again. Uh, for example, this is a 
a project, one of our last realizations uh, in the month of May, where we reduced the five car lane uh, main road to a four car lane uh, road. And so now, for the first time in 20 years, this is really a symbolic um, uh, thing, we can um, we can cycle on this main road. And uh, it's also about efficiency, of course, because uh, we, we could transport 6,000 cars uh, an hour, but now we can uh, transport 12,000 plus 5,000 people an hour uh, on this uh, road. And so people are cycling on this new road and uh, they are using scooters and uh, uh, bikes uh, and all these things. Uh, it shows so that um, bike-friendly cities are they, they, they choose for more mobility, for more space, and eh? more space becomes available. It's better mobility, it's clean air, it's uh, safe also, and uh, the cycling is uh, also a, a fast way, an easy way to transport from A to B. This is another example eh, of a main road that was constructed in uh, in Brussels, and there is no space for cyclists at all. Eh? Uh, we have only some pedestrians, and even they need to walk in the greenery because everything is given to the car. This is after five years of work. Uh, this is what we realized as now. Realized now, we invested in uh, tramway. Uh, but also in uh, separated bike lanes on the other side, you can see it. But this is only done by reducing space for cars. This is another place, a car parking in the center. And this is how it looks today. So we have uh, fountains. This, is, this shows that public space should be seen not only for a mobility uh, at, as its mobility function, but also as a meeting function. And people should meet, uh, and I see it in the South American cities, people are still living on the streets, uh, but in Brussels, we, we forgot it. Uh, for 7,000 years, we did it, but last 100 years, last 50 years, we started uh, pushing uh, as much, much cars as possible on our public space. And so I will discuss a little bit more the Brussels bike policy and how we came to this point. In 1995, we had, a, we had the maximum highest degree of uh, urban exodus. And so then smart politicians started uh, thinking that we needed to uh, invest in a livable uh, city. In 2005, the first bike plan was made. We made the bike more visible. Um, and in 2015, for the first time, we started uh, massively invest in dedicated, separated infrastructure. Eh? As uh, Stephen, Stephen said, um, it can be a light segregation, but it can uh, uh, other segregations uh, as well. But you need to give dedicated space to the cyclists. But this is uh, now we are today at eh, 2019, uh, and cities they they look a lot on they think. Um, globally, that they need to invest into infrastructure eh, first, because the, by, the cyclists had their own bike from A to B, uh, that was a, an, a, a privately owned bike, and the, the city just needed to invest in comfortable infrastructure. This is rapidly changing because cyclists are the, not only having their own uh, bike, but they are asking more and more, they are demanding more and more um, uh, bicycle and cycling services and for example we have um, we have uh, these scooters that are coming up to our cities just to explain that uh, a lot of cities and even brussels uh, lack uh, a digital strategy um, they lack a services strategy on cycling uh, this is explained by the, the docked system that we have uh, today. This is a bike sharing system that is docked, but it's not connected uh, for charging. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, free floating dockless. Uh, I put uh, bird there, but we, we have lime, but others as well. But uh, bird scooters, for example, and that are dockless. Um, and um, and uh, but they need to be recharged overnight. And uh, both operators are, or cities, they are looking for new solutions to tackle these problems. We have electrical mobility on the one hand, and on the other side, we have docked and free floating mobility. Uh, and we need to try to find a strategy to make it more sustainable. And so this is how it looks eh? today. We need to invest in this uh, in this uh, services uh, strategy. We started uh, integrating cycling services into our policy. For example, you see here um, 
secured bike parking in uh, Brussels that we opened, but also we invested in repairing services, repair uh, stations. And we invested in uh, open data, open data policy uh, to make it possible for the public to develop their own uh, applications. So for example, some students in Brussels developed this route planner um, that you can uh, use on your smartphone. Uh, another example is uh, the bike registration that we have in Brussels. Uh, that is uh, now for the first time that we that you can register with your smartphone and with a simple sticker that is irremovable, your uh, privately owned bike, uh, in order to uh, tackle uh, bike theft. So there are a lot of things coming up, and I will talk, uh, of course, today only uh, about. Um, about uh, scooters, e-scooters. There is a clear business interest, and so companies are interested in scooter share. Uh, this uh, this picture shows this. Uh, we have had in Oakland 2018 more than a million uh, scooter share trips. It's more than the car sharing number of car sharing trips, and so we see that there is a clear um, business interest. They, you can earn money with a scooter share. But there is also public interest. Eh? Cities, they want to uh, push uh, cycling and make cycling more easy and more fun. Uh, we, we, need, we want to push, um, uh, we, need, we, we want to reclaim public space, uh, guarantee inclusion and democratic pricing, and we want to tackle air pollution. So we have an interest in investing in, in this kind of mobility solutions. And so um, we looked to find uh, a balanced framework. Uh, on the one hand, to meet public authorities' interests, and on the other hand, private actors' interests. Uh, they demand uh, we can provide uh, them a legal security, a level playing field, uh, and they want a single point of contact. They want a uniform framework, framework uh, as a city on a metropolitan level. And so when we talked, when we thought about the balanced frameworks, we thought that a, a licensing system was the best way to deal with this, um, this new kind of mobility. Our licensing system has no limitation for the number at this moment, no limitation of the number of operators and no limitation of the number of bikes or scooters. But we have uh, license conditions that need to be met and we have operating conditions as well. I will. Um, explain that more in detail. So this framework um, is actually a balanced framework because it's something actually when, when these scooters and the, these private actors are coming to your city, you have different ways of dealing with it. Uh, you can um, clearly prohibit uh, the, the, um, the, the scooters and or you can do nothing and leave it up to the market uh, and hope that everything will be fine. Uh, so we, ch we chose between uh, for a system that is very clear for everyone, for every player, it's a level playing field, but we chose to be a welcoming city. Uh, and so from uh, 1st of September in 2019, uh, every operator active in Brussels needs to have a license. And so um, these license conditions, yeah, you can find them in the documents, we can share these documents, they are public, uh, and they ask uh, more or less, first of all, a plan of approach with a lot of obligations, technical ob uh, obligations, conditions about the charging infrastructure, for example, and about uh, they need to show that uh, they use only green power. Uh, combustion engines, for example, uh, for example, are not allowed anymore. Uh, they need to explain how they cope with insurance, uh, cope with pricing, uh, how many vehicles they have, what's their coverage, uh, and they need um, a reporting system to the administration and they need to share open data. I think globally, um, the, most of the operators are okay with it. Eh? Uh, we don't have a problem with operators today. They are saying that the license conditions are too hard or too problematic. So these are standard regulation rules, uh, but it's so important for us to have this information eh? to be able to um, to be able to to know what's happening in our city. On the other hand, we have day-to-day -day operating conditions, and these operating conditions they can change. Uh, first of all, we, we also put uh, low standard uh, operating conditions and it's uh, more or less about uh, parking, parking rules. Eh? Uh, I will come uh, more, I will speak more in detail afterwards. So the responsibility 
that's an important thing, should be and should stay as much as possible at the operator's level. Of course, the operator, eh, for example, BERT, they will uh, make their user core responsible for what's uh, happening. Um, but it's so important to not take, as a metropolitan authority, to not take risks or responsibility, you cannot cope. At our side, we have a metropolitan authority and they have on one hand a strategic team. They are thinking about sensibilization and about and they are monitoring everything that's happening. And on the other hand, we have an operations team that is uh, focusing on the licenses, on the conditions, uh, if, if they're met or not. And most important thing is that we act as a single point of contact, not only for the operators, which we, we are with uh, in, in a constant dialogue with them, but also with the local authorities, for example, police, municipalities, and also users or cit uh, citizens. Eh? Some citizens are complaining about these uh, scooters. And so then we can be in a dialogue and they have a single point of contact. And this is important to have this contact, not only for the operators, but also, also for the citizens, because then they feel that they're, 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 the people listen to them and that there is uh, some kind of system uh, in place. Of course, when there are big problems, we have a five-step uh, solution. We first uh, um, put in place a warning. In 24 hours, this problem needs to be solved. Then we have a fee for uh, removing the bike. Then we have a fine. If there is no response, we can have we can impose a fine. And of course, when there is still no response, and if it's uh, dramatically uh, problematic, then we can suspend or even withdraw the license of this operator. Of course, this is not the, the meaning of a applying these sanctions, but it's also to, to show that uh, people active here in Brussels should be um, responsible, of course, act responsible. So is it uh, easy in Brussels? No, we have 19 local municipalities and sometimes they start um, inventing their own rules. Uh, of course, this is not allowed because we thought we, we, we made the competence for uh, shared e-mobility and mobility we made it on the metropolitan level. And so the, basically the, the local authorities, they don't have the, the competence anymore to uh, regulate uh, this kind of mobility. Uh, um, let's talk about parking. Eh? Uh, have we problems with uh, parking? Yes, of course, because our uh, footpaths are too small, actually. The big problem is, of course, that there is too much parking space today uh, and that the footpaths are too small. Uh, we, we ask the users and the operators to respect the general traffic rules. Uh, for example, this, uh, this e-scooter is in the middle of the, the street, of the pavement. It, it is actually not allowed. He should uh, park somewhere else. Uh, but we are not finding, finding these people actively. So then we have no parking zones. We will have it only. This is an ongoing policy. And we will have no parking zones in um, touristic and high density zones, for example, shopping streets. Uh, and then we uh, are also putting in place dynamical no parking zones. This is, these are concentration zones. For example, when there are too many e-scooters of different operators at one place, then we can impose a concentration zone. Also, security perimeter, as we are the European, the capital of the European Union, uh, when there is a European summit, we can define a security perimeter and then we ask to remove the scooters and marketplaces as well. And then there is the question about drop-off zones. I think drop-off zones are a very bad uh, solution and a very bad um, idea. Um, and the, one of the questions that was asked today uh, um, from Belo Horizonte uh, and also from, uh, and Bert was talking about it as well, uh, that is these kind of drop-off zones, they, they shouldn't be um, imposed. Uh, we are convinced that we have bike racks and that actually we should just double the number of bike racks if the number of bicycles in the city is doubled. And uh, we have this new operator, so let's, um, let's double the drop-off zones. Voila. Uh, just to end this presentation, I will just I just want to look forward to the to the future. Uh, I think cycling is an important part of the of an urban mobility uh, policy, and therefore we should push cycling as a part of mobility as a service. We have now in Brussels a lot of. Um, 
uh, active operators. I see that BERT is in there, but actually the others, they are uh, active uh, today. BERT is uh, maybe coming uh, to Brussels um, in the future. So um, this is how it looks, the future. What we want to do is to create a public backend. Eh? All operators ask it uh, to the public authorities to have this public backend um, where we can a sort of data lake, where we can put all the data from different operators in it. And then, we, then the others can fish from this data lake some data for their front ends, for their applications. And of course, the backend needs to be public to, to make it uh, neutral, but also also to be able to push um, uh, public interests. And for example, if you want to, to promote cycling in the streets, okay, let's uh, push cycling in uh, some way uh, in, uh, through these backends. Um, and this will look like this. Eh? We will have uh, applications where you can choose with one click on your smartphone uh, for different uh, urban mobility solutions. Uh, since mobility solutions are one click away, the bike policy of cities should focus not only on dedicated infrastructure, but needs also to de develop a digital and cycling services strategy. Um, public authorities. Matthias? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. You have three minutes. Perfect. I'm almost almost finished. <laughs> so public authorities and cities they need to organize themselves. They need to uh, change uh, exchange best practices. Uh, we need uh, data standards also on a European level. We need consumer protection on European level. And I think uh, uh, public authorities should organize themselves and they sh should exchange more as we do uh, today. Uh, by being a welcoming city for private actors, free-floating micromobility can be a part of a sustainable bike policy if we have a balanced framework as we did in Brussels on a metropolitan level. Uh, with less cars and more cycling, we can save public space and build human scale cities. It's about safety, it's about livability, it's about what kind of city we want for our children and for the people living in uh, our cities. So thank you. This is my um, uh, contact information uh, on LinkedIn. You can find uh, me, of course, and you can uh, ask me some questions uh, uh, afterwards. So. Great, thank you very much, Matthias. And um, now I would like to uh, invite um, all speakers to join the panel uh, so that we can proceed with some questions that we have from the audience. And also, and also, I would like to afterwards go back to the questions that were posed by um, by Diego. I'm not going to uh, Alvin screen Alvin's website because um, he, his internet connection is not the best and he cannot turn on his webcam. But he is there, right, Alvin? Yes, Rosa, I'm here. Perfect. So um, the first question that we have is for, for Emma. And um, it says that recent reports stated that the average lifespan of a scooter is 26 days. How does that combine with the sustainability goals of work? Hi, um, just, can I ask anyone who's not speaking to go on mute because the line is quite bad? Um, so I've, I've seen those reports and uh, all I can say from a bird perspective is that they're not accurate. Um, I think that in the very, very early days of scooter sharing, the models of electric scooter that we used probably did last much, much less time than they do last now. I don't know quite if 28 days is an accurate uh, figure, but um, I suspect ours lasted a lot longer than that. If they didn't, I think we would have gone out of business a lot sooner if you look at how many rides and how many users we have globally. In terms of sustainability, of course, a ride share electric scooter is at some point going to come to the end of its useful lifespan. Um, we hope that doesn't happen very quickly. We like to look after our vehicles. So all of our vehicles have um, field mechanics that will go out and look at them in the field. We also have mechanics to take them back. Obviously, they're charged every night, so they go back into the warehouse uh, and they get a full inspection as part of that sort of um, that warehouse charging procedure. 
Um, if a scooter does look like it's come to the end of its useful life, our scooters are modular, so we can strip down a lot of the parts, everything from the bell to the handlebars, the little mud guard on the back, the lights, all of that can then be reused on another vehicle, used as spare parts to repair other vehicles. Um, so we do like to think that we're doing our bit for sustainability in that sense. Um, in terms of the battery, um, there are quite strict rules um, in most parts of the world about how you can dispose of those types of reusable batteries. And we, of course, adhere to those and aim to go above and beyond those rules wherever we can. Um, the real question here, though, isn't like, are there a few scooters that are getting scrapped because they've come to the end of their useful life? If you think about and compare the amount of metal and plastic and all kinds of other materials that go into a car, um, you're not even in the same ballpark as a tiny little scooter. So, um, yes, we hope that we will be improving the durability of the vehicle and that we'll continue to improve the durability of our rideshare vehicle for a long time to come. Um, but, you know, we're not, we're, not, we're not in a perfect world. These things will at some point come to the end of their useful life, and it's incumbent upon us and all other rideshare operators to make sure that they're making the best use out of the parts that they can rather than junking the whole vehicle. I hope that answers your question. Great, thanks, Emma. And uh, the second question is also for you and for Stephen. And it says, when do you think it will be possible to apply remotely controlled geofence speed limits on vehicles? Not just e-scooters, but on cars as well. Stephen, did uh, you want to answer? Think... Yeah, sure. It's uh, already possible with uh, cars, with the ISA. Uh, technology that's now become mandatory in the European Union, uh, whether it's operated by roadside um, transponders or done on a GPS basis, road systems work. Um, the level of detail at which you can operate it in then is a question of um, the quality of the network um, that you're using. But I would have thought it was relatively simple to adopt a system that did that for um, mixed streets. Um, it's not a it's not a system that's in operation yet, but technologically, I don't see there'd be an additional cost, I guess, on the operator side in that they'd have to uh, make sure their GPS uh, systems were of high enough resolution to, op to, to, to operate in that mode. But it would certainly be better than the general limitation that uh, it's been introduced in Paris in the, the last few weeks, reducing the maximum speed of the vehicles from 25 kilometers an hour to uh, 20 kilometers an hour. I would have thought the starting point was a uniform limit for in mixed use areas of 30 kilometers an hour for all vehicles, especially cars. And the lack of coherence between the two is, um, I would say, you know, unfair to scooters really, <laughs> especially making uh, them 10 kilometers an hour lower than the, uh, the mixed use uh, standard, well, what's become very recently the standard speed limit for, uh, for motorized vehicles. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm perfectly happy for Bird um, to and uh, as a company we're very happy to adhere by the local speed limits that countries or cities decide to impose. It is a little strange to me that both Germany and recently um, France have decided to opt for um, a speed that is about five kilometres an hour slower than the pan-European regulations for um, pedal electric bikes, basically. So it seems very odd to say, well, if you're an electric scooter, you can go this speed. If you're an electric bike, you can go a little bit faster. And if you're an electric car, you can go as fast as you like. Um, so to, to a degree, I sort of agree with Stephen, but also just really want to emphasize we're totally happy with the speed restrictions as they are. Um, slower tends to be better on, on an electric scooter type vehicle. I don't think that we really want to quite be going um, sort of 30 kilometers an hour um, particularly where you know um, we've got you've got um, scooters mixing with other types of, of vehicles. Um, I think that um, the best situation is that you just have parity between bikes and electric scooters or e-bikes and electric scooters. So that means uh, assisted power of, of up to about 25 kilometers an hour. The next question um, is also for you, Emma, and it's what could be the financial contribution of shared micromobility service providers to use public space for parking, moving in comparison with car operators, private owners and com companies as well? Sure. And I think that there is an opportunity for cities here to 
um, view electric scooters as a revenue stream. Um, I mean, I'd obviously prefer it if we can operate in a city without having to pay some kind of levy or tax, but I equally do understand that there is, for some local authorities, a big issue around the revenue stream that they will lose from car parking. Often it's not politically viewed to be a vote winner to lose that car parking space either. Um, so there is a question about how do you monetize that? We are already, as a company, paying um, operational fees or permit fees in several cities out of the 120 cities where we operate. The critical thing, I think, is to find a balance for that fee where um, rather than renting public space, you're linking that fee to the utilization of the scooter. So in areas where we've seen the fees linked to rental of public space, the incentives are misaligned between the city and the operator. In an area where you say um, we, will, we will levy a fee that is, say, a per ride fee um, as a city on the number of rides you have as an operator, that tends to work much better as a model for us because it aligns the incentives between the city and the operator to increase utilization, thereby decreasing car use. Um, and it also means that the operator is incentivized to put their vehicles in the right places that will be highly utilized so they don't become street cluster. So, it and, and it generates revenue for, for the city. Great. Um, and the last question from the audience is to Stephen. And uh, do you know any example of a scheme for a fair distribution of financing public space use among different transport mall service providers according respective to an urban mobility policy? Um, I don't know of a financing uh, program that's explicitly linked to the urban development uh, plan, but certainly, I mean, the French cities, starting with the biggest ones, but now all cities have the obligation to produce a sustainable mobility plan um, going forward as to how they uh, plan to make use of uh, the cities. Um, maybe Brussels has uh, a, better, a better view on this uh, as being an actual uh, city government. Um, there are also systems in place in some cities such as London where uh, there is a requirement now, an indicator that was introduced of the accessibility of each uh, location across the city. And if a developer wants to build a building, a uh, commercial building or a high rise um, residential building, they have to meet the certain um, accessibility criteria, usually in terms of how easy it is to access a, um, a metro station, a bus station or, or a rail station. Uh, and if you don't have that kind of public transport access, you have the option of paying a contribution to the development cost of expanding the network to be able to link the new development to the existing public transport network. And with major developments, that can be seven, you know, multi-million uh, euro contributions to development of um, some very heavy infrastructure. So it would be very uh, straightforward to add uh, into that uh, facilities for share for e-scooters, for example, to be able to be parked easily in a new development at any scale. So there are systems available that could be developed along those lines, but I'm, I'm not so sure any exist at the moment. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you can see my screen. Can you see it? We can see uh, Bayo Horizonte. Yes. <laughs> I we can see your screen. No? Uh, OK, so now you can see it, right? Yeah? We can see the slides of Bayo Horizonte. Yeah. So. Um, what I want to do with this slide is that I think Belo Horizonte posed very important questions from the perspective of the local governments. And I'm pretty sure that in the line, we have a lot of uh, local authorities that um, are wondering the same things as they are just starting to receive uh, um, an important number of operators. So um, I don't know if you are, are you still there? Then maybe I, I'm, I'm sure that um, you already uh, address a lot of the questions that are posed here, but I would like to hear from Diego maybe um, if there is some some 
specific question that you would like to address to the speakers um, so that they can answer it right now. And uh, maybe then we can come to an end with um, uh, conclusions from all the speakers. Diego, are you still there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, I think the most important question uh, and, and challenge we are facing right now is about the safety, the safety issue, because um, we are facing, we are having a lot of accidents, and and probably we would like to to tackle this problem first uh, in the regulation, and so. I think uh, because actually we have a problem because we don't have so a, a lot of a very uh, big infrastructure of bicycle paths to to receive all the e-scooters users. So what we are thinking now is how to make the the ride safer without having uh, some. Uh, good infrastructure and so I don't know and in about parking I think I heard from Matias about the drop-off drop-off zones and it's something we are wondering about how to implement here and and so I don't know maybe the questions about the question is about the safety how to ensure that the safety is provided in the in the, in the rights Perfect. And um, so, and, and with regard to these, que to these questions that uh, Diego just posed, uh, I would like to hear what the other speakers have to say. Maybe we can start with you, um, um, Alvin. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes, yes. Um, well, I, I, I would uh, just like to to, to um, recognize the, um, the, the the questions by Degu, oh, particularly I would like to to um, what do you call it like to 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 uh, state a specific example at least for the parking uh, parking question. Uh, there's an example I think it's in Sacramento. Um, what they have done is that they've actually converted some of the curbside parking for for cars. Um, to be used for the scooters, and then um, they levy a, a certain um, revenue fee, revenue loss fee, for the parking meters um, towards the scooter sharing company. So uh, I think this is uh, an additional option to look into, um, you know, uh, balancing some of these elements that uh, that are already there in the cities in terms of spaces, um, um, and and allocating some of it. To, to the e-scooters, uh, to the e-scooters themselves. I think um, you know we will see a lot of uh, these more dynamic types of uh, interventions um, for um, allocating space uh, for for the scooters themselves. Yeah. Thank you very much, Alvin. Um, Stephen, maybe some reflections about the issue. So yes, the I mean immediate action is not so obvious, but you should do. Um, I think Emma probably has some ideas there. But I, in a broader sense, use the opportunity. Now, you've got a, a strong demand from a certain part of the public that they want now more protected space. Use that to do what you should have been doing for uh, already, which is providing the separated safe infrastructure for cyclists. So build a public relations effort uh, to secure resources to roll out that um, quite politically painful uh, replacement of car parking places and car driving space for moving to the better pavements and uh, protected cycling space. Great, thank you. Um, Emma, maybe you? Hi, yeah, thanks. On the, um, on the issue of safety, I'm, I'm going to, as I said, there's, a, there's quite a comprehensive report from Bird on, on safety, which Stephen touched mm -hmm. on, and I'm happy to send that on to anyone. I will post it at the top of my LinkedIn page, um, so you can just click the link, the hyperlink there. Essentially, like obviously, infrastructure is is the favourite plan, but we do appreciate there probably isn't the time and the resource to put in segregated cycle lanes in lots of cities, um, and it does take time as well. Um, there is 
the the what we call the kind of safety in numbers effect, which we hope will occur as more and more people start to cycle and get out of their cars, which is that you have fewer cars on the road, more bikes, um, more people bicycling and more people scooting. And that actually creates a safer environment for all road users. Speed, again, as we know, is like a big issue. And that's why there's a trend towards cities around the world starting trying to slow cars down. In London, a number of streets have gone from 30 to 20 miles an hour. Um, and that has seen a dramatic reduction in, um, in casualties over the short period of time that they've been doing that. Um, it is something that we like to partner with cities on. We do view safety as our responsibility. There's the safety of the, 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 the scooter rider versus all of the other road users. Um, and, that's, and part of this is to do with the road surface and the infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. But part of it is to do with the behaviors of those road users towards each other. Um, and that is why I think it's really, really important that you know the, the speeds of electric scooters are regulated fairly and equally along with electric bikes, electric cars, um, so that everyone's on a level playing field. Um, to your point on parking, I th this does really seem to be a, a favorite plan of cities to, to link the cost of parking scooters to, to the way that we manage car parking. Um, as I said before, my nervousness on, on levying a fee in that way is that it doesn't align the incentives of the operator and the city. You'll end up with the operator and the city pulling in two different directions for what they want. And I, I would prefer to see a model that generates revenue for the city by encouraging more ridership of electric scooters and less cars. Um, and that, in my view, is some kind of fee that is a per ride fee. So, for example, um, a, an electric bird scooter costs a uh, dollar to unlock and about 20 cents a minute to ride. What if um, five cents, 10 cents from every ride went to the, the local authority and could then be used to fund um, an officer to interpret the data, an environmental officer or could be used to fund more segregated cycle infrastructure or improve road surfaces. Those are the kinds of partnerships where the incentives are aligned and I think will be much more long lasting and much higher value for both partners. Great, thank uh, you very much. Sorry, if I could come back in again, Steve. Um, yeah, I'd very much support the speed limits. What on both sides, um, remember at the beginning of your presentation, Diego, uh, the standard speed limitation on e-scooters is 40 kilometers an hour, which is very high. Um, so I don't know what you apply in Bear Horizonte, but more importantly, the car speeds. I mean, I don't know whether you have uh, 50 kilometers an hour as the maximum speed limit across all built up areas, except in uh, on roads designated for through traffic and 30 kilometers an hour speed limits designated in all mixed use areas. Um, if you don't, that's the fastest way of reducing the severity and the incidence of uh, of crashes with all vulnerable users, including um, e-scooters. And then if you're collecting data that um, allows you to identify the circumstances in which these e-scooter crashes are occurring, that could give you the information you need for some low cost interventions, particularly at junctions where they're likely to be the crashes, for simply painting the road, for example, to steer where the bikes and e-scooters are supposed to negotiate through their way through the junction and cars should keep out of it uh, and matched with enforcement where the police is instructed to take care of e-scooters as well as uh, everybody else. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if I can in interrupt. Effectively, uh, yeah, you need, first need to lower the car speed. I'm convinced that it needs to be done. I'm not sure if you have 30 kilometers an hour in the the smaller streets already. Uh, I think this is uh, very important. And then, of course, some small uh, infrastructure interventions. So uh, even if it's painted, even uh, you can start with that. Uh, maybe you can also separate it with the light interventions. Um, in Brussels uh, and in Belgium, we have 20, uh, 25 right. kilometers an hour for scooters. Eh? This is important to know. Uh, if we talk about parking, um, I hope I was clear. I do not believe in drop-off zones, uh, mandatory drop-off zones, because then we, we are asking the users to, to go uh, 100 meters or 200 meters uh, from their house uh, to, to, to look uh, after a scooter. Uh, we don't ask it not, uh, neither to um, car drivers. Eh? So it's very important that they can park everywhere. 
uh, apart from some specific spaces. And then, of course, we can sensibilize, sensibilize them to uh, really invest into uh, bike racks and uh, just uh, in, uh, increase the number of bike racks in the city. About the fees and about um, have a taxation for uh, scooters, I'm not, not really believing it because uh, the small ones will be pushed out. Eh? So the birds and the limes and the Ubers, they will be able to um, to pay these fees and they don't have a big problem with it. Maybe there are some nice small players, they have a good idea, a good uh, solution as well. And we, we want to make this uh, market this the open eh, for everyone. Um, we are subsidizing for this moment uh, car uh, cars company cars in, in belgium so this is a problem that we should attack first we should not tax uh, bikes i'm really convinced of that no mandatory helmet as well we have in belgium no age limit and maybe we should uh, think about the age limit uh, i think it's a it could be a good idea in in, in order for uh, safety uh, but the mandatory helmet it's again it's it's something that is uh, not the solution for safety the solution is lower car speed and the solution is um, make infrastructure uh, I, I clearly believe in it then i have one question to um, bird to emma uh, because yeah we we have out there there are a lot of people they do not believe in the um, in uh, in scooters or they are very critical and so we received a lot of questions and i think we need to build um a, a sort of coalition of believers uh and for example if we talk about life cycling uh, assessment uh, about the the age of these uh, scooters it's very important to have clear data on it and um it's so hard to to get it from uh operators eh, from all kind of uh all kind of uh, operators they they treat it as confidential as i can um believe eh, as i can uh, see but for me it needs to stop i i uh, i think it's important that we share more data on uh, life cycling on charging on uh, business models how people charge or social issues i think this is important to be able to respond to the non-believers Emma, did you did you hear Matthias' question? Could you just repeat the question? Sorry. It's just about life cycle. So that the data on life cycling, life, life cycle assessment. So on uh, the lifetime of these scooters, uh, that we, if we could change, exchange some some data on it. Also on the charging systems. Um, the charging uh, that, that is used. I, I believe it's confidential for a lot of operators, but we need to be able to respond, to answer questions from users, uh, from citizens and other political parties that, that, that are very critical for it. What, what I would say is that on the latest BIRD model, uh, there isn't enough life cycle data to give yet, unfortunately. You've got to remember that Bird as a company is only about two years old. Electric scooter rideshare is only about two years old. Um, as I said, I don't know what the data was on, on the model that we started out with, but that model, there are many of them still in the market today. So those will be quite old now. Um, they're being phased out in favor of the newer model. We don't we don't know how long that is going to last yet. We can't say because it hasn't been in the market. We can make our best estimations, but I can't give you any data because it hasn't happened yet. So all we can do is make our best estimations um, by looking at the trips that we had before, the vehicles that we had before, by testing as robustly as we can our, our latest bespoke vehicle. But I, the one thing that I really want to emphasize, and I can't emphasize this enough, is that media reports that you read about electric scooters lasting 28 days or a month are quite frankly really fundamentally flawed because they are based on a very very old model of electric scooter that almost all the electric scooter rideshare companies did launch with and almost all of them now admit that that was the wrong thing to do and that that model just simply wasn't robust enough to be in the marketplace we are learning at an incredible pace um as you've seen like there's been absolutely there's been no um, new type of vehicle in the world that has ever had uptake as fast as the electric scooter. And my goodness, are we learning lessons quickly? Um, are we learning them fast enough? Maybe not, but I really, really hope that I'll be able to share that data with you in a year or two years time and say, look, the latest model of, of Bird e-scooter that I'm talking to you about now 
is still out there in the market, um, you know, and is lasting a really, really long time because that's in all of our interests. It's in the interest of the environment, it's in the interest of the city, and certainly in the interest of a business to keep their vehicles on the road for as long as possible and to keep their fleet in good working order. We all want that. And I think it's um, it's astonishing that some people are quite cynical and think that incentives aren't aligned there because they really, really are from all perspectives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I still effectively, I still believe that uh, the, the reactivity, more reactivity uh, even, is is uh, still needed. Eh? So uh, to in order to to make it uh, to to give this possible this positive message uh, as well, eh? because we talk a lot in the press, for example, about the negative consequences, but we should be able to talk about the positive uh, things as well. Not only safety, uh, parking issues, um, uh, I believe. Right, I'd, Thank I'd, you I'd very love. Much. I'm telling all, I'm sending all the journalists your way, Matthias. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, you all, for participating in this webinar. Thank you very much to all the speakers. We hope that these were, I'm convinced that these were really good inputs for all the participants. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I would really like you to share the reports that you mentioned in your presentation. That would be great. So that I can also... page now and I'll email it to you yeah. as well. Perfect. And then I will share the presentation, like we would uh, put them online, the presentations, if you all agree, we will put your presentations online and I will share the link to your presentations with all of you, including all the participants, if you agree with that. So thank you very much again and I hope to see you soon again. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.